In this video, we're going to talk about how to download YouTube analytics and run some statistics on them in R. I'm here on youtube.com and all of this data are going to be provided to you. So don't worry about it, but I want to show you how to get data like this from YouTube. I'm currently logged in to the CEC channel and I'm going to click on that little icon in the upper right hand corner and select YouTube studio. You could do this on any of your channels if you use YouTube and really any social media outlet has analytics, although some of them are a little bit more difficult to get to. That's just the way they work sometimes. Over here on the left hand side, I'm going to click on analytics and I'm going to immediately put it in advanced mode. That's where we can go to download the analytics so that we can run some analysis on them. Here's the advanced mode for our CEC TV channel. And we can see the default is to list a handful of videos, essentially the videos that have been uploaded in the last little while, and to show information like views, watch time, subscribers, and so forth for the last 28 days. That's just the default. I want to actually look at what would be more of the popular videos that are on this channel. See what our audience is more interested in. We can assume that the more engagement they have with those videos, the more likes, the more comments, the more shares, impressions, things like that. Those will be the things that will show whether a video is really awesome or not and whether we should make more like that. So I'm going to change this to from it's right now at last 28 days. I'm going to click on that and select lifetime. That's going to show us all of the videos. And in this view, we only see it shows right down here, showing top 50 results. Please use exports to view up to 500 results. And I'm not sure if there are 500 videos. I have no idea, but we are going to export this data and have a look. But we do want more information than this. Right now, it does show the views. It shows the watch time, subscribers, and so forth. But we want to get more information so that we can run our analysis. The way we do that is by hitting this little plus sign. I'm going to add basically everything in this list, subscribers gained. And unfortunately, there's no really easy way to do this. I have to do this all one at a time. So I'll do subscribers lost as well. Also add likes. We want to know which video people like more. Dislikes. Likes versus dislikes, which may not be useful to us, but that's okay. We'll go shares. and comments added. Now, if I look at the list one last time, just to make sure I've got everything I could possibly need, you can see there are some things in here that we've done over here. So they kind of get grayed out as well, which is totally fine. That looks about right. So I am going to now export this up here in the upper right hand corner. Normally we'd see this as being an upload button on YouTube, but it changes to a download button for analytics click on it. And I've got two choices. I've got Google sheets and I've got comma separated values. This CSV, this comma separated values, this is kind of a generic way of formatting data. And it makes it so that things like any statistical package, even Excel, things like that can all use this format and import this format. So this is the one I'm going to use. I'll show you how it works in just a second. I'll click on comma separated values. It says preparing for download and it begins to download down here in I'm using Chrome. And so it shows up down here. If I click on this, it opens up my file system and I'm going to go ahead and change the view of that. And we can see in, inside here, I have chart data, table data, and totals. I'm going to show you what the comma separated values format looks like, just so you're aware of it. So that it could, it could be useful for you in the future. For that, I'm just going to right click on this table data and I'm going to open with just this normal old, just this text edit. It's just, I mean, there's nothing to it. This is kind of like notepad in windows, if that's what you use. If we look at this, I'm going to go ahead and zoom in just a little bit on this text as well. If we look at this, we can see that along the top, we have what would have been the headers for all of these fields starts with video and then also notice that they're separated by commas. So I have video, video title, video publish time and so forth. 
And then at the end of every row, I have a carriage return. Essentially, they, it's like, like they hit the return key. Then we can see as we go down a little bit lower, I've got this kind of jumble of weird text. That is the video ID. So every video on YouTube gets a video ID. That's the video ID. So if we look at that, that's where it says video. That's that first column. Then it says video title. We can see that this one that has this video ID is 2019 Huntsman World Senior Games Global Cup Finals. Next is the video publish time. We can see it's August 31st, 2018 and so forth. So uh, basically what we have is we have everything separated by commas. If there's something that's left blank, they just leave it blank. They just have a comma and then it's empty and then they have another comma. So every, every field, if you wanna think of it that way, has its own set of words with commas separating them. And then at the end of each row, you have a carriage return and that brings us to the next row. You can almost imagine this as being a spreadsheet where the commas are the lines that divide the columns and the carriage returns are what divide the rows. So that's a little bit about, about how comma separated values work. Now let's go ahead and go into R. The first thing we need to do in R is we need to install a couple of packages. Now, R is a computer program that allows us to do statistical analysis, but there are some things that it can't do, but people have written additional pieces of software that essentially extend its capability, and they call these packages. So what we need to do is we need to run a command down here in the lower left-hand corner. I've got my cursor here. It's gonna click inside this window, make sure I got a blinky cursor, and I'm going to type install.packages. You can see that our studio says, hey, I'm trying to help you out here. It looks like you're trying to type this. Once that comes up, you can actually use the arrow keys and select specifically what you're looking for. We're looking for install packages, not installed packages. So we'll select install packages, we'll hit the return key, and it says, great, and it essentially just auto-completes it for us. What we're looking for is we need to put in quotation marks within the parentheses, the word tidy verse, just like that, T-I-D-Y-V-E-R-S-E. We'll hit the return, and what R does is it looks out on the internet, and connects to a specific server looking for this package called tidyverse, which is what we need. Now, it gives us this error message. Depending on when you watch this video, it might be a little bit different. It may not actually have this message, but for us, it has this one. It says, hey, we've got a, a compiled version of this program, but we have a newer version that hasn't been compiled yet. Do you want us to use the later version and compile it for you? That's basically what it's saying. We'll just type the word yes with a capital Y, hit the return key, and R will do a little bit of things. Now, depending on your system and what you've done in the past, this may take more time or less time, uh, depending on what's going on. But eventually you're gonna come up with this little character right here, and that's basically R's way of saying, I'm ready for something new. So we've got this taken care of. Now, there's something we need to do to this data. I'm gonna go back over to our data. Here's my cheat sheet for how this video is going to work. There's a lot going on. But here we are back in the video, YouTube data. And uh, by the way, I've, I've named it YouTube data. Uh, what we have, the top row gives us the headers as we've already talked about, but the next row gives us this one called total. This is gonna throw off our statistical analysis if we leave it here. So I'm going to select this whole row and just delete it out. And then I'm going to delete that extra line as well so that I just end up like that. Now, I don't wanna to delete too much. I just wanna delete the, the one row and the extra line. Now, down at the bottom, if we scroll all the way down, there's a final row that says showing top 500 results. This also is something we don't need. And so we are going to get rid of this. We'll just select that whole line, delete it, and then delete that final row, making sure that we don't delete the extra comma that's down here. I'm gonna go ahead and just hit my save button, my shortcut, Command S uh, on the Mac. And now there's something else. When we go to import this data, there are two specific characters that appear in this data set that R has a hard time with. And that's the pound sign, or the number sign, or the hashtag, whatever you wanna call it, and then the apostrophe as well, the single quote. So we need to get rid of these. Now, 
I'm just going to do a quick find. The shortcut for me is Command F. On your system, it might be something different. And I'm just going to type the hashtag or the number sign, the pound sign, the uh, octothorpe, whatever you want to call it, this symbol here. And you can see that we do have three instances of this symbol in our data. We need to get rid of that. So for me, I'm going to just type or click this replace button. It depends on your text editing system for how you're going to do this. You might just have to do it by hand. It's up to you. But I'm going to take this and replace it just with nothing. I'm just essentially just going to delete all instances of this pound sign character, all three instances. For me, I'll just click all. And then we also want to do the same thing with the apostrophe, the single quote. You can see as soon as I do this, I end up with about 16 or so instances of this character. And if I leave it in there, then R is going to have a hard time importing this data. So again, I'm just going to essentially delete it by hitting my replace and I'll replace all of them. I'll save that now. And now I can import this into R. Uh, what I need to do now, now the, the way this works is we're going to import the data and we're going to give a reference to that data. We're just going to call it something. This is kind of like giving it a file name within R. So I'm just going to type the, the characters that spell out CEC data, just like that. And then I'm just going to type the equal sign because I, I'm essentially saying it's not like a math thing where this is equal to something. Essentially, I'm just giving whatever I'm loading here in a second, I'm just giving it a name so that I can refer to it in R. Now I'm just going to take my cheat sheet over here and I'm just going to copy this and I'm going to explain what it does in just a second. Let me get rid of this extra equal sign that I put in here. All right, so I'm giving this thing I'm about to load a name called CEC data, and then I'm giving R a command, and the command is called read.csv. CSV is for comma separated values, like we've talked about. And then I'm basically in the parentheses going to tell R the, the thing I want it to load. So inside the parentheses, I do a couple of sets of quotes, one at the beginning, one at the end. And inside here, this is a file path. For me, because I'm working on a Mac, this is what the Mac file path looks like. Uh, for me, if we look at this data, YouTube data.csv, for me, it's in my downloads folder in a folder called video, and it's called YouTube data.csv. On the Mac, I need to put this little tilde symbol in here and then use a forward slash, the downloads folder, a forward slash, there's the video folder, a forward slash, and then the name of the file with its extension .csv. All of that gets inside these quotation marks. If you are on a Windows PC, you might have something like C colon here. And Windows, unfortunately, uh, is different from Macs, and rather than having forward slashes, it's going to have backslashes here. So you'd want to change all these out to the slashes that are above the return key that are the backslashes. So that's more like what it would look like if it were in your downloads folder on your Windows PC. If it's in a different folder, say the desktop or something like that, you would put the word desktop here. So eventually you need to get the proper file path. Now, if you have issues with this, just let me know. I'll do what I can to help you. Once we've got it all typed out, I'll hit the return key. And one or two things happen here. I end up with a new character down here. And as far as we're concerned down here, we don't know that it, di that it did anything, that it worked. That's one of the things that R does. If there's no error, it basically just kind of does nothing. It says, okay, great, that, that executed correctly, and here's our, I'm ready for the next entry. If we look up here in the upper right-hand corner, though, in the environment tab, we see now we have a thing called data, and it says CEC data, 500 observations of 15 variables. And if we look at our comma-separated values that we got from YouTube, we know that there are 500 rows here, and that there were 15 columns. And that's what it's essentially telling us here is there's 500 observations, 15 variables. Now, what's nice about this is our studio gives us the ability to look at this like a spreadsheet. We just have to click this little symbol here. And now we can see this as if it were in a spreadsheet. I can scroll to the right, I can scroll down, and I can look at all of the columns and rows of this data. It looks just like this, but everywhere there's a new row, we've got a new number here with a new row. 
and everywhere there's this comma separation, it's essentially saying, okay, we're on a new cell, a new column. So we have along the top video, video title, video publish time, comments added. There you go. Video, video title, video publish time, comments added. The only difference is, is that R adds these little dots where there used to be spaces. That's just to make it so that there's no spaces in the, the, the variable names. If you want to talk about it that way, the column names. So now we've got it all loaded up into R and there's a couple things we need to do. I'm just going to look at my cheat sheet. Uh, we've already installed tidyverse. And what we want to do now is we are thinking of ways that we can analyze this data. Uh, one of the things I've thought about is some of these video titles include the word St. George. And so some of these videos that are in here, like this one, State of the City with St. George Mayor John Pike, it says St. George here. So many of these videos originate in the city of St. George. And then there are other videos that don't originate in St. George, or at least it's not shown. What I thought might be interesting is if we did an analysis to determine whether people like the videos from St. George better than videos that are not from St. George. So the first thing we need to do is we need, we need to tell R that we want to search through the video title and determine if the words St. George exist in the video title. And then we're going to add a new column that essentially just keeps track of whether St. George appears in that video title. We're just going to call it is St. George. And there's going to be two values in that column, either true or false. Let me show you how it's going to work. And then we can, I can tell you how, it, why it makes sense for us to do this. So I've typed out a command here, CEC data that tells R that we want to work with the data set that we have imported already. I have a dollar sign here now. This is a magic symbol that tells R that we're going to give now a column name or a variable name. And after the dollar sign, I've typed out is St. George. Notice there's no dots in here. That's just the way I've written it is St. George. Because this column name doesn't exist, R is going to make a new column to the right. This is almost like in Excel or a spreadsheet program that you added a new column, gave it a name, and then just kind of went through and and populated all the cells underneath that column. We're going to do the same thing, but we're going to let R do it for us. So we've got CEC data. We could think of that as being the name of the sheet. If we were working in Excel, a dollar sign, and then the name of the column. And then here's this symbol here. This is, it looks like an arrow. It's really just the, the, uh, diagonal bracket, the left diagonal bracket, and then a dash. So it's two characters that make up that symbol that kind of make it like an, a, a, an arrow. And essentially what we're saying is, is we want to populate the cells underneath this column with whatever we have here. And so what I've done here, you can just take my word for it. This is something that, that essentially this string detect, it basically just looks for whatever it sees in here. It's going to look in the video title column, which is our video dot title here. It's going to look for the words St. George written just like this. So you can see, I need you to type it just like this string R colon colon str underscore detect. And then you'll have a parentheses inside the parentheses. You'll have CEC data dollar sign video dot title, a comma, and then you'll have in quotation marks, the word St. George, I'm going to execute that command by hitting return. And what happens now is that our spreadsheet up here flashed and it, it's essentially our studio's way of saying this has changed. I'm going to scroll over to the right and we can see now here's our new column. It's called is St. George and it has either the word false or the word true in it. It's false if the word St. George didn't exist in the video title column. And it's true if the words did exist. So if I scroll over here, you can see, there you go. State of the city with St. George mayor, John Pike, all of these didn't have the word St. George. We finally have one that does have St. George. And that's why we have all of these being false and this one being true. All of that was done by this single command up here. And I know it's a little cryptic, but once we understand how this works and as we get more experience, this makes more sense. So now if we wanted to see if our videos were more interesting or more popular for people who uh, like St. George videos, videos about St. George, we need to make a way for determining this idea of popularity. So we can almost think of this 
is it in St. George or is there the word St. George in the title as being our independent variable? And we need a dependent variable. Now, there's a lot of information in YouTube in, and in this data set that can help us know whether a video is popular. Of course, we've got views. That's a, a very, very interesting way of knowing whether something's popular. Obviously, the more views it has, the more popular. But we also have things like likes. We have shares. We have subscribers gained, right? Someone likes the video so much that they subscribe to the channel. And then we also have comments, right? And some of these things, they take more effort, right? And so to view a video takes very little effort. Effort. You just click on the video. To like a video takes just a little bit more effort, right? You have to click another button to like a video. To dislike, it's the same idea. To like or dislike a video takes about the same amount of effort. To subscribe, that's a that's kind of a commitment, right? You gotta you gotta think, hey, I like this. I I want more content like this. So to have an additional subscriber, that that could be something important. And then to share, that's another thing that that requires you to kind of put yourself out there, kind of like, hey, I like this video, and I think you might like it too. So some of these things kind of take more effort, and so they show that the video was more important to someone. So I worked out an idea here. Uh, I thought about it and I said, what if, what if these things were kind of like a point system? I'm going to go ahead and zoom this in a little bit. What if this were a point system? What if, if a video gets a view, it gets one point. If it gets a like, it gets two points. But if it gets a dislike, it's negative two points. If you gain a subscriber, you get three points. If you lose a subscriber because of the video, you get negative three points. If you add a comment, that's four points. And if you get a share out of it, that's five points. It's almost as if the more effort that's required, the more points you get. And then I thought, well, what can I call this? Instead of saying points, what can I call it? And I come up with a, with a really awesome word. I thought I, I was really proud of it. And I thought, how about affinity? You know, the idea of someone really liking a specific video. So what we need to do now is we need to calculate on every single one of these rows here, we need, to, we need to calculate the number of points, right? The affinity score for the, each of these videos. And we can have R do this automatically. I have the next command here. I'm gonna go ahead and copy it and then I'll explain what it does. I'll copy this and paste it into R. So what we have, have here now, same thing like we did up here. We're gonna do the CEC data set. We're going to put the dollar sign here and have a row or a column called affinity. This is an, a, a column that doesn't exist, so it's going to add it. Inside that, for each row, we want to run a calculation. We want to take, again, each of these is just the CEC data and that has a dollar sign for the number of, for the column name. So you can imagine just the column name here is the important bit, but we do need to type it all out. We take the views, we add then the likes that are multiplied by two, and that's because each like gets two points, right? So we multiply the number of likes by two. We subtract the number of dislikes, and I need to add that times two there, can't make that mistake, because a dislike is actually worth negative two points, right? So we have this minus dislikes times two. We have the subscribers gained times three, and that's because we have subscribers gained times three, that's worth three points. These subscribers lost, and again, we need to multiply this by three. So I'll add that in there. The add, then the comments added times four, and then add the shares times five. So essentially what this does is it says, okay, let's take the number of views. We'll add the number of likes times two. We'll subtract the number of dislikes times two. We'll, we'll add the number of subscribers gained times three times negative three, four, five, so forth. So essentially we're adding up all of these points based on our little table here. I'm gonna go ahead and execute that. And R then takes care of all of that magically. All that calculation happens. It runs for every row and calculates this affinity score that we just came up with. Multiplies it all out, adds it together, and comes up with a single number that gives us this idea of affinity. And certainly the ones that have more shares, right? Because it's multiplied by five, they're going to go up faster. But if you've got a video that's got a huge number of views, it's also going to be a really large affinity, which makes sense. So now we have this idea of an affinity score 
And we have now, whether a video is about St. George or originates in St. George or doesn't originate in St. George. So what we're going to do now is we're going to run a t-test. Now, if you don't know what a t-test is, we can talk about it, leave a comment, I can help you out or let me know. But for R, we're just going to type t.test and then inside parentheses, we need to tell the two columns that are going to be our independent and our dependent variable. Now a t-test, just your basic t-test, is going to take a categorical independent variable, right? This just this nominal categorical independent variable that has two groups in it. And then it's going to have a continuous dependent variable. So our independent variable is going to be whether the video talks about St. George or not. It has two groups, right? Either true or false. Either it does or it doesn't. So it's a categorical independent variable that has two groups. It's about St. George or it's not. And a continuous dependent variable. And for us, that is this affinity. If a video gets uploaded to the channel and has no views, no likes, no subscribers, its affinity score is going to be zero. But it can also go really, really high. And there's this idea of there being continuity. There's there's a, a continuous number. It's like a continuum for affinity. So we've got our independent and our dependent variable, and the names of these variables are the column names. I'm going to start now with the dependent variable. That's, that's a little bit opposite of what we would think. So I'm going to say that it comes from our CEC data, put the dollar sign in there, and I'm going to say this, this is affinity. As soon as I start typing, it auto-completes for me. And then I need to do a tilde. Now a tilde is above the tab key on the keyboard. Uh, you have to hold the shift key down and you'll see that little kind of curly dash. It's called a tilde. And now I'm going to put the independent variable. Again, a little bit different than what we expect. But I've got is St. George. And I can't forget though to put my CEC data. I need to tell it where the data needs to come from. So I give it the name of the data and then the column name, which really is my variable name. So it's a t-test. The dependent variable goes first, the row, or I should say the column, then a tilde, and then the column for the independent variable. And I'll hit the return key. It runs my t-test and gives me information. Now, the important information here, as far as we're concerned, is this p-value. And we've talked about p-values in the past. For purposes of media research, we want our p-value to be less than 0.05 if the test was significant, meaning there was a significant difference between the videos that were from St. George and the videos that were not from St. George. In this case, the p-value is 0.7, which is clearly greater than 0.05. So what this means is there is not a significant difference between videos that have St. George in the title and those that don't in terms of their affinity score, which we calculated based on our, our score that we talked about. So that's one way of saying, if someone says, well, are the videos that are about St. George, are they more popular? And we could look at this and we could say, well, statistically speaking, they're not more popular. All right, so that's the first test is to determine which videos might have more affinity. Now, we could certainly break this up into new ways, see if there's other ideas or other descriptions or other keywords inside here, maybe Doc Utah or maybe Desert Hills or something like that. One of the things I was thinking of though is there are quite a few videos that are sports videos, football, basketball, uh, some of them are college sports, some of them are high school sports, but I thought, hmm, I wonder if our audience likes football videos more than they like basketball videos. So what we need to do now is we need to say, okay, how can we get this into uh, a way of us grouping this into two groups? One that is a, a video about football and one that is a video about basketball and leaves out all of the other videos, 
right? Because the only way we can compare football and basketball is if we're not also comparing something like a story to tell with Jan Roberg or LSD warning 2018. We need to get rid of all of these videos that aren't about football or basketball so that we can compare just the videos that are about football and basketball. So what we're going to do is we are going to uh, first make new columns called football and basketball and search for those keywords inside the title. So we've done this before now. I'm just repeating this, but with different words. I'm going to paste this in. We're going to have CEC data, dollar sign, and then the column name, which is not existing yet. So it's going to start a new column called is football. And if inside that for each row, it's going to look for, that's this thing looking for something inside the video title column, and it's going to look for the word football. So something like this, where it says region nine football, it's going to have a new column at the very end that's going to say true because it has the word football in it. If I run this now by hitting the return key, you see that little flash. If I scroll over to the right we can see, sure enough, is football. Now we have true here and these, the rest of these are false, but we have another true down here. If I scroll over here, we sure enough, it says football right here. So now we've marked all of the videos that have football in the title, but we're also looking for ones that have basketball in the title. Uh, I'm going to do a little shortcut here. I'm just going to make sure that I've got a flashy cursor down in here. I'm going to click inside here. If I don't, I'm going to hit the up arrow. The up arrow loads the last command that we executed. So now it's the same thing. But what I need to do is I need to have the column name be called is basketball. And I'm going to look for in the video title, the word basketball. So I'll just type and change the same command that I did earlier. But now I'll call the column is basketball and it'll look for the word basketball. I'll execute that. We get the flash up here. And again, if I scroll over, now I've got all these falses because the word basketball didn't appear in the title. But now I do have on this video, I've got basketball, sure enough. So now I have two columns that show whether there's basketball or have if they have football in the title. But in order to group these now and leave off the ones that don't have this false, I'm going to do something uh, that essentially just subsets this data. I'm going to look for only, uh, I, I, I basically want to have a new, a new sheet in Excel, a new data element that is only containing the rows that either are about basketball or about football. So this command here, now I'm going to go ahead and copy and paste this and I'll explain what it does. We're going to start a new sheet. If you're thinking about this from Excel called sports and inside that sheet, I'm going to take a subset of this sheet up here, my CEC data sheet. And that's how that's basically this first area inside the parentheses. It's just saying, what do you want it to act on? So I say, great, I want you to act on the CEC data. And what I want you to subset is based on this stuff here. I want you to look at the is football column. And if it is equal to true, now this equal sign, you can see this is just two equal signs. This is just R's syntax for looking for equality, right? If, if within the column, the word equals true, then it's going to add it to this sports sheet. It's going to add that whole row. Notice we got to use two equal signs here. If we don't use two equal signs, if we only use one, then it's going to change all of the rows to true. And we don't want that to happen. Now that's looking for the is football, but we also want to look for is basketball. If is basketball tr is true. So either one or the other, and this pipe symbol right here is just a magic symbol for the word or. So the pipe symbol is just above the return key. It exists with the backslash. We need to hold the shift key down to use it. So we've essentially said within the CEC data, the is football column, if it equals true, or if in the CEC data, the is basketball column, that one equals true, add it to the subset that we're going to call sports. So I'll execute that command. You can see now we have a new data element. It's almost like a new sheet in Excel called sports. 
Notice also it says 47 observations of 19 variables. It has the same number of variables, the same number of columns, that's good, but it only has 47 rows now instead of 500. It's because only 47 of the rows had either basketball or football in the title. If we want to view it, I can click on its little symbol here. We can see every single one of these now should have either the word football or basketball inside the title, and sure enough, they do. So now we have a subset of data that is only videos about football and basketball. Now we can do the exact same thing we did before where we, where we ran a t-test. This time it's going to do the sports data set, the affinity column, just like we did before, the tilde, and then the sports data set and is football. Now what we're doing here, I'm going to go ahead and copy this and paste this. Click inside here to get my flashy cursor paste it. Now we're essentially just grouping this based on whether the is football column is true or false. Now notice these are always going to be opposites, right? Is football and is basketball. These are always going to be opposites. This is true. This is false. This one's false. This one's true. If it is football, then it's not going to be as basketball and vice versa. So we can group this either by it, whether it's football or whether it's not football. So I chose just to say, great, I want you to determine for our independent variable, is this a video about football or is it not? If it's a video, video about football, then we know it's a video about football. If it's not a video about football, because we've subset the data, we know that it is a video about basketball and then look at the dependent variable of affinity. I'm gonna go ahead and run that. We look at the, the results here now, and for our purposes, we're looking at the p-value, and we see here 0 0.0013. That is definitely less than 0 0.05. So the results of this t-test were significant. There was a significant difference between our affinity score for videos about football and for videos about basketball. Now. The test just tells us there was a significant difference. It doesn't tell us where the difference is, but what's nice about it is it does tell us the mean or the average for whether is football was false or true. In other words, if in this column there was the word true, meaning it was about football, or whether that was false, meaning it was not about football, and therefore it was about basketball. So if we look at the mean the average score, the affinity score, we can see that where it says true, those are our videos about football. And where it says false, those are, are our videos about basketball. We can see that the affinity score was higher for football and lower for basketball. So this tells us that of the, the videos that are about football and comparing them to the videos about basketball, the audience preferred or had an affinity for those that were about football. And that was a significant difference, meaning statistically speaking, the audience prefers videos about football when compared to videos about basketball. That's what we can see in this. So if our managers were looking at this and saying, do people like football better than basketball? We could say, yes, they do. They prefer it. Uh, the test was significant and the mean score for videos about football was higher. This could be good for management decisions. If the, if the station says, Hey, should we, should we cut out, we need to cut out sports. Should we cut out our coverage of basketball or should we cover, cut out our coverage of football? We can look at this, run the test and say, Oh, we should not cut out our coverage of football because people prefer it over basketball. So that's one way to subset the data and run a t-test based on only videos that have specific keywords inside of here. Now, as I look at my cheat sheet, maybe we want to know if as time goes on, is the channel getting more affinity, right? Are, are people engaging with the channel more? Are we growing an audience? When we look at some of these numbers, we might look at it and say, okay, well, yeah, we're growing an audience because we've got more comments and shares as time goes on, right? And you might see a trend, but it might be nice for us to visualize that trend and determine whether we're significantly increasing in our audience. So what we can do is we can say, okay, well, when did the channel start? When was our first video uploaded to this channel? If I 
scroll over. Now, actually, I'm going to go to my CEC data. I don't want to look at just the basketball and football. So I'm going to go ahead and click on my symbol here. That's going to load now our CEC data into this, into this viewer. And if I look at the video publish time, this gives me the date that the videos were uploaded to YouTube. So essentially I could look at the first video that was uploaded all the way up to the most recent video that was uploaded. I'm gonna order this the same way we would in other, any other spreadsheet program. I'm just going to click on this. And you can see now, as I click on it one time, we now have ordered this by the publish time. We end up with the 1st of August of 2017. But there's a problem. Hmm. Look, it's ordering by the day. One, ten. Obviously, this is not right, right? April of 2019 is not before August of 2017. So the problem is, is that we have the day first, obviously. So we need to reformat this and put it so that it's orderable for us. What we're going to do is we're going to use this right here. This is a command for us to put the date format in not only a standard date format, but also in something that's orderable. So let me explain what I'm going to do. I'm just going to copy this over here, click my mouse cursor inside here and paste it. What we're going to do is we're going to start a new column called date reformatted. And within each of the cells of that, we're going to format a date. And the date format for this is going to come from the video.publish time, which of course is this column right here. But we need to tell it the format that this each of the cells in here has as its format. Now this looks a little crazy. I totally get it. Just trust me on this one. What this is doing, the percentage symbol and then the letter is just telling us which one's a day, which one's a month, and which one's a year. This first one, percent %d, that means that the first characters in here are the day of the month. The dash here tells us that we're going to see a dash. This percent %b, I know b is not short for month, but what this is saying is that this is an abbreviated version of the month. So that b, I think, is just a way of saying abbreviated, who knows. But it's an abbreviated version of the month. Then we're going to have a dash, which we do, and then we're going to have the year. Now the year right here with a capital Y is actually going to look for a four digit year. And you can tell these are not four digit years, these are two digit years. So I'm going to change that to a lowercase y, and we're going to run that. Everything seems to be fine. I'm going to go ahead now. I didn't see a flash up here, and sometimes that'll happen when we have multiple data sets. I wanna make sure that this reloaded the data, so I'm just going to click on my viewer here, CEC data, that's going to reload this data. If I scroll over to the right now, I can see I do indeed have this date reformatted, just like we asked it to do. And we can see it has the year, then it has the month, and then it has the day. If I look at this, this 2018, so this is September 1st of 2018, we can see here this is correct. It is September 1st of 2018. But what this does now by having the year, and then the month, and then the day, is it makes this orderable. I'm going to go ahead and click on this column. You can see now, hmm, interesting. We'll talk about this in just a second. But you can see, apart from these 1970 dates, I do have the earliest date of any video that was uploaded is 2015, and it was September 30th of 2015. If I scroll all the way down to the bottom, all 500 rows, we can see that the, as far as this data set is concerned, the latest video that was uploaded, or the one that's most recent, was 2020, and it was March 30th of 2020, which if I look at today's date, that's a little over a week ago, as I've been trying to prepare this video. So let's talk about these 1970 dates up here. If I scroll all the way to the top, I've got one, two, three, four, five dates that say 1970, and they have January 1st. This is YouTube's way of telling us that for some reason or another, it has no idea what the published date of these particular videos were. So to tell us, hey, we're, we're gonna tell you it was published before the internet even existed and long before YouTube even existed, it's essentially telling us that these are errors, that for some reason or another, YouTube doesn't have this. So what we need to do in order to make this work, because we don't know when these videos were published, we're going to eliminate these particular videos from the data set. So I need to, to do that right now. Uh, I've got one, two, three, four, five of them that need to be eliminated. I'm going to go down 
and look at this first column. These are the IDs for, or the, the row name for these first five videos. I've got these five numbers now that, that identify the first five rows. I need to make a list of those. I'm going to go ahead and while I'm here, I'm just going to change that to a lowercase y and resave that. Now, I need to make a list of these bad row numbers. I'm going to go ahead and copy this, paste it inside here. You can see it's almost like I've done this before, right? 313, 349, 403, 436, 484, and it looks like I've got one too many, so I'll go ahead and just delete this last one here. Let me explain what this does now. So what I'm going to do is create a list. This is just essentially just a, a new sheet, right? A new data sheet that just has just a list of numbers. That's all it is. So it has one row. Uh, the C, we're going to ignore it for now. You just need to have the letter C, no big deal. And I'm just going to list these row numbers that are bad row numbers, separated by commas and within quotation marks. I've got one, two, three, four, five, and it's those five that have that 1970 date. Now I'm going to execute this command, and it doesn't actually remove those rows. All I've done is create a list of the ones I want to be deleted. I'm going to use now a new command that I'm going to copy from here. Copy it, and what we're going to do now is we're going to uh, take our CEC data and re-mess with some stuff and just store what we've re-messed with back into the same sheet. So this is kind of funky syntax. It may not make a lot of sense. I'm going to explain it really briefly. Just trust me on this one. We're going to take the CEC data. We're going to uh, have all of the rows that exist except for the ones that are in our list that we want removed. So essentially it's going to take all of them except for the ones that are here and it's going to store it back inside that sheet called CEC data. I don't know that ex explanation didn't work too well, but that's what we're going to do. I'm going to execute it really quick. I'm going to go ahead and reload it by clicking here. And we can see now if I reorder this by hitting my date formatted, we have uh, our 2015 September 30th being the first one. We no longer have those 1970 dates. Notice also that the length of our list used to be 500 observations. Now it's 495. That makes sense because we deleted five rows. So that's what we need to do now. Now it's orderable, but the problem is, is that this is still not a very useful continuous variable. I'm thinking that if we're going to determine whether our channel is getting more popular or if our affinity score is getting better as time goes on, we're going to need to do a correlation or a regression. And a correlation and regression, they require an independent variable that is continuous and a dependent variable that's continuous as well. Our affinity score is continuous. We've already talked about that with the t-test, but our date reformatted, this right here, although the date is continuous, this is a really difficult number to work with, right? It's got dashes in it, not really the best thing. So we need to turn this into days. Right now, it's a, it's a year, month, day format. I wanna turn this into days so that we can measure this based on days. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this command. Now I know I'm getting really funky here all over the place. I'm going to copy that, click inside here and paste it. I'm going to make a new column, numerical date. And in each of the cells, I'm going to take a numeric date now, as opposed to having this that's formatted like we're used to, year, month, day. I'm literally going to take that and just convert it into a number. I'm going to execute that and show you what it does. Let me reload it, scroll over here to the right, and I'm going to reorganize this. You can see here it says 2015 930, and our numerical date is 16708. Now what is this? Uh, this numerical date is, and now this is really funky, it's a lot of computer science history going here. Uh, this is the number of days since January 1st, 1970. So this right here, this September 30th, 2015, was 16,700 days since 
January 1st of 1970. I'm not going to go into the backstory as far as the Unix epic and all this other stuff, all these crazy words and other stuff for the reason why January 1st, 1970 is the start date, but that's just the way it is. Now, this is cool. We can see that, that 16,708 days, this one that was nine days later, you can see, yep, add nine days to 708, we get 717. So we know we're right, we've got it correct, but it still doesn't make sense to say, well, let's start at 16,708. I think we should start at zero. The first video that was published, let's have that be the zeroth day, and then we'll count the number of days since then based on when each video was published since then. So essentially what we need to do, to do is reduce each of these numbers by the start number, 16,708. So we've got it right here. I'm gonna copy this in here. What we're going to do is take our, our numerical date, a column that already exists, right? So it's not going to make a new column. It already exists we're going to store inside each of the cells of that column the numerical date before we make the change and then subtract 16,708. So this is almost like saying, take the numerical date in each row, subtract 16,708, and then store that back in the same cell. So all this is going to do now with this command is reduce every single one of these numbers here by 16,708. I'll go ahead and execute that command. I'll reload, scroll over, and we'll go ahead and uh, order by this. You can see, sure enough, we've reduced every single one of these by 16,708. The first video was published on the zero day, and then every video was, was published a certain number of days after. There was quite a few that were uploaded nine days later, quite a few that were 10 days later, from that very beginning, 16 days later, and so forth. So now this represents the number of days since the first video was uploaded. That's the idea behind this. Great, so now we have something that's orderable and gives us an idea of when these data were, or when these videos were uploaded. Let's go ahead now and run a regression. We love statistics, don't we? I'm gonna go ahead and copy this, paste it right here, and I'll explain what it does before I execute it. We are going to start a new variable. We're going to call it linear mod, and that's short for linear model. This is just a fancy word for regression, a linear regression, which is something we've talked about in the past. Within this variable, I'm going to execute a command called lm, which is short for linear model. It's going to take as one of its variables the affinity and it's going to also take the numerical date from the CEC data data. All this is doing is it's running a regression using affinity and numerical date as the two variables. The numerical date for us will be the independent variable and the affinity score is going to be the dependent variable. I'll go ahead and run that. We can see that it starts a new data element up here, linear mod, doesn't show us anything though. In order for us to see it, we're going to type the word summary and then inside parentheses, we're going to tell what we want a summary of and it's going to be that linear mod. I'm gonna go ahead and hit return. This we've seen, right? We've seen it run a test before with the t-test. It's run a regression on it, given us a whole bunch of information about the regression which we're not as worried about but what we are worried about is we wanna see the p-value. The p-value is all the way down here. You can see right here, it's 0 0.1908. This is greater than 0 0.05. What this is telling us is, is that there is not a significant movement between time and our affinity score. In other words, as time increases, the number of days increases, our affinity score is not increasing in a linear manner. It's not going up in a linear manner. That's okay. We are not necessarily wanting it to be linear in, in the way it goes up. We just want it to increase. So, okay, the test isn't significant. Does this tell us it's not increasing? Well, let's go ahead and visualize it. We can visualize it by running what's called a scatter plot. A scatter plot is essentially just an X, Y coordinate system that plots, in our case, the numerical date 
on the x-axis and affinity on the y-axis. On the x-axis, the numerical date, time will go on, and on the y-axis, our affinity score will go. So let's go ahead and run this. We can see over here in the lower right-hand corner now our numerical date on the x-axis and our affinity on the y-axis. These are all the plots of every single one of the videos. Each of these now at 500 or so, 600 days since the first video was uploaded, we had a video that had an affinity score of say 20,000. At about, I don't know, 750 days since the beginning of the channel, we had an affinity score that was greater than 2,500. And then most of them though are way down in this area. It kind of makes it difficult to, to really see the plot of this line having these elements in here. So let's go ahead and get rid of these elements just so that we can see whether our affinity score is getting higher as time goes on. I'm going to go ahead and reorder this spreadsheet by affinity score. I clicked it once and that's going to go from lowest to highest. I'm going to click it one more time so that I get the highest scores. Now we can see here's our 26,880. That's this video right here, 26,880. We've got these others here that are all representing these ones that then start to go lower and lower on the Y axis. Let's go ahead and get rid of quite a few of these. Let's get down to a point where we can spread this out and really see whether our channel is getting better. Maybe we can just, now this is just not really a statistical analysis. It's just more so we can visualize it. Maybe we want to get rid of, I don't know, say all of them that are, I don't know, greater than 5,000 or greater than 6,000, something like that. I think I've already typed this out. Yep. Sure enough. I've already typed this out. I'm going to get rid of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten of these. I'm going to copy this, paste it, and before I execute it, I'm going to tell you what I'm doing. I'm going to get rid of ten of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So basically, I'm getting rid of every single one of them that have an affinity score greater than 5,000, which is about right in here on the Y axis. So every single one of these videos up in here, we're going to get rid of, and that's going to allow us to really spread this stuff out. So I'm going to make a list just like we talked about. It's the ID numbers. So 4, 65, 72, and so forth. There they are right there, all the way down to 109 and then 5. There's 109 and then 5. I'm going to make that list, execute it, and then I need to actually redo the data, CEC data, getting rid of those row numbers that I don't want to be a part of it. I'll click it, or I should say execute it. I'll reload it up in here now. And we can see now if we reorder by affinity and then push it again to go descending, all of them, them that are above 5,000 are now gone. And also notice we've now total, in total gotten rid of 15 of our rows. I'm going to go ahead and run that, that scatter plot again. I'm going to click inside this window, hit the up arrow a few times until I see my scatter smooth command. I'll execute it again. And sure enough, it re-executes it, getting rid of all of those large ones that were at the top. And you can see our y-axis has different numbers here. Now, what we can do is we can visualize this line, which is the, which is R's way of trying to represent kind of the average of all of these videos that are going on, trying to kind of plot a linear line. We can see that at the very beginning, the first five or 600 days, which is about the first two years, we were really increasing in affinity. And then it started to level off and possibly even kind of come down just a little bit. Now, how do we interpret this? Does that mean the channel is getting worse? Well, not necessarily because remember the way we calculated our affinity, we've got shares worth a lot. We've got comments worth a lot and so forth. It could be that just people aren't sharing as much or they're not commenting enough. Uh, so our views may be going up, but our views alone may not be enough. So we could actually plot views if we wanted to. I'm going to go ahead and just hit my up arrow and rather than doing affinity, I'm just going to go ahead and change this to views. So we have the numerical date on the X axis and the number of views on the Y axis. This is the total number of views for each of our videos, right? Now we have views on the Y axis. Here's the views for it. Is this going up? It almost looks the exact same, doesn't it? So does this mean we're leveling off? It does actually look like we're leveling off. If we're increasing, we're increasing very slowly. Now we may find that this is the case for any channel we use on YouTube. It gets, it gets really, really important for a lot of people at first, and then it just kind of levels off. Uh, that makes sense. 
So what do we learn from this? We've run a t-test, we've run a regression, and we've plotted some data all from a data set that came from a YouTube channel. This is important stuff. Now, I totally get it. This is hard. In fact, this is a really long video. This is challenging stuff. Uh, it may not make sense. If you want me to do some further analysis, or if you've got questions about this video, do let me know. Throw something down in the comments. Happy to help you with this as much as I possibly can. And I look forward to seeing you, working with you on the next video. Mm -hmm.